today's this week's installment is La Guerre de Gradisca. Um, this is a Europa Simulation uh, game. Uh, I'm trying to remember why this hooked me, other than the topic, which, you know, is one of those that war is that's so unknown to me that that immediately makes it exciting. <laughs> um, we're looking at eh, right about the beginning of the Thirty Years' War era. Uh, and this is really a situation where some raiders are coming from the Habsburg lands, disturbing Venice, Venice and the Empire, and then later with the Habsburgs, had this long and, you know, convoluted history, let's just put it that way. But uh, here, here you have uh, Venice trying to take back a city that used to be theirs and, and a region that used to be under their, their power, really. Uh, if you've played Machiavelli or anything, you'll, you'll have seen um, some of that interaction in that game. I haven't covered that yet. I actually have the boards. I just ran into them recently. <laughs> I don't know where they are, but yeah, gosh. I, I just remember seeing them and saying, huh, that's interesting. Um, anyway, uh, I know almost nothing about this, but it's an era that I like, and I've learned to trust uh, this company to put out some interesting games. Uh, we've seen uh, the Napoleon in Russia, I think it's called, uh, and obviously the Guelphs and Ghiblins, and geez, I'm trying to remember what else. There was at least one other that I remember really enjoying, but uh, anyway, I've always got kind of an eye out for it. Uh, this is one where I decided, okay, let's see if there's any, you know, let me subscribe and see if there's any that are for sale that are reasonably cheap. And, well, it's a recent game, so the answer was, uh, not really. <laughs> for about the same price, I could buy it and get it shipped uh, from the company. So I just did that because um, I hadn't been buying many games and... This seemed like a cool idea. It's an area-based game. You have the areas divided by these lines and then the river lines as well. Some of the areas have names in them. Those are necessary for setup, uh, not necessarily initial scenario setup, which is handled by this card here, but um, for events that come off the cards. Uh, it uses chip pull for commands. So you have a bunch of chits in here. These are the command chits, which you pile up in there, <laughs> I guess. Um, and uh, we can, uh, you know, you have this very pretty map. You don't have to worry too much about, wow, it's kind of hard to read. Uh, the important thing in it is the area divisions. Those you can see reasonably easily. They might take some getting used to. Bridges are important. These yellow, bright yellow triangles, which <laughs> are a little bit of a defacement, but uh, they indicate rough terrain. Terrain that's going to be, uh, is going to have enough of an effect on play. Uh, you have walled towns, fortresses, the individual military units, which include engineers, you also, the fortresses are here and here. They're kind of hard to see because there's a lot of pieces in them. Um, what else is of importance? You have forts, which are allowed to be anywhere except inside fortresses, and they provide additional defensive benefits. Basically the same that a walled town does. Um, Counter-wise, like I said, you have military units. It's going to be using a buckets of dice system. I'll probably grab some different dice because it gives you these. These are good dice, but I kind of favor smaller dice, uh, especially in buckets of dice type games. 
what else do you have? These are for a reduction of walls. You're going to be actually bombarding and destroying wall sections, which is what these numbers are. Uh, these are to mark units that you've activated. I don't know what's on the other side of here. We'll see. Uh, these are for raiding, which is something you can do. I assume these go with a couple of events. Uh, rules are in Italian and in English. Uh, as are the cards. Oh, everything's bilingual. Um, that can be a little difficult, probably for both people, uh, because you know you have to find your right language in it. But it's a it's a good solution. Uh, allows games to be published in Italian and still reach the English-speaking audience that's much, much larger. Not that, you know, I mean, almost everybody in Italy s speaks and reads English, but it's so much easier to deal in your native language. Uh, and I, of course, do not read Italian at all well, which is a pity because the historical introduction is all in Italian. As are the author's notes, and they're not they're not translated, which is a shame. But uh, there's not that much more than wiki, I assume, in here. <laughs> it looks like actually a fair amount more, but there's not much available in this game. So we'll go with the English rules because it's always best when at least uh, someone involved understands the language that they're looking at. All right, um, so commanders have this leadership value on them. Uh, regular units have just a, a strength value on them, essentially, although for artillery that counts as their fire value. Um, the bar across the top indicates which command chip uh, rules them. On the backs of the counters, there's a disorganized side for most of them which indicates they've taken hits. On the backs of some of the leaders is a replacement leader. In case the leader dies, he flips over to the replacement. Um, these guys have a fire value, but it's uh, in brackets. That's actually more applicable towards repairing walls and doing engineering feats, although I think it affects uh, how they get damaged as well. Uh, you got a deck of cards, some of which are not in play to begin with. They're basically event cards. Uh, and we'll take a look at how uh, they're used. You'll have a hand of cards throughout the game that you're working with. Sort of like a CDG, but it's not. You have the option to play cards in your turn. So it's more like, uh, I mean, they call it card assisted now, but it's more like a few old war games like War of the Ring used to have the original. Um, anything I missed here? Uh, we got the turn record track here with two month turns. Uh, uh, so one of those markers is the end of game marker, which is variable. Uh, I don't know what the other one is yet. Ah, so the sequence of play. Well, in turns, you pick a command marker at random. The units of that command can be activated and the player can play some cards. Um, and then the drawn command marker is placed up here so you can see which commands have actually gone. Once all the command markers are done, you check uh, whether an area has combat units in excess of its stacking limitations and the turn marker moves forward. If it went beyond the end of game marker, the game's finished and you count victory points. By the way, some of the spaces have victory points on them, uh, like here. There's also these hmm, buckets of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's these batino, which are victory point markers that are hidden. You don't know what they're worth until you uh, reach them. And there's the camps. We have a camp here. 
And let me find the other one. And a camp here, which is sort of the center of the Army's organizational uh, impetus. You'll also have a supply source, which is here and here. And you can draw from there as well, but the camp extends your supply line. Some of these are optional rules. So the camp, for example, is an optional rule. I'm trying to remember what the other one is. Army morale, which I'm tracking up here, is an optional rule. Uh, okay. When you draw a command marker, you're allowed to play up to two cards from your hand, and you can activate um, all the units of that command that's in one zone. Then you draw... Uh, another option is you could draw a card and just add it to your hand. You're never allowed to have more than four cards in your hand. And if you do, you have to discard one. Um, this is sort of a way to pass. And then the final choice is if you have a commander for that particular command. And so, for example, this is a commander for the purple, for the dark purple. And some of these are a little hard to see. There's like black and dark purple. My eyes have trouble discerning. We'll see what we can do there. Um, you can play up to one card and activate um, a num uh, the units in a number of areas equal to the commander's command value. So that allows you to grab a... Uh, to conduct operations that are uh, of greater scope. Um, the plague cards all form a discarded deck pile. I don't know where they'll put that. Uh, once the deck has been finished, you reshuffle. Um, but some of the cards are one-use cards, and they say that in them. Uh, to activate any units, you select the area containing the units of the command. All the units belonging to that commander uh, are allowed to activate. This is done um, for all areas involved, one area at a time. When the units finish their operations, their command marker goes on the map. And yeah. um, when any unit in the zone is activated, it can do one of the following. Move into adjacent areas and eventually enter areas containing enemy units which can cause a field combat. They can bombard an adjacent fortress, if they're artillery. Uh, they can bombard units um, in adjacent areas, if they're besieged artillery, or through a breach. You can do mining and countermining operations on a fortress, and this is just your engineers. You can build forts with your engineers, or you can recover your units from disorganization. And you're only allowed one of these choices. Uh, you can mark units with the activated marker, if you wish, <laughs> to help remind you which areas you're activating or something. Okay, movement. Um, infantry and engineers have a three area movement rate. Artillery has two, and cav and commanders have five in general. You move uh, generally one movement point per area that you move. Uh, but difficult terrain costs two. You can't cross impassable boundaries. Uh, you're not allowed to pass through a crossing um, through a vertex. Each time you enter an area containing enemy units, you have to stop. Uh, units can move individually or as stacks of units. I don't know why you'd want to move as stacks. I couldn't find a reason. If you move as stacks, the movement allowance of the stack is the lowest value of the uh, capacity of the units that make up the stack. Friendly units along the way can't be collected during movement. They'd have to move on their own. Units in a moving stack can be left behind in the crossed areas. Commanders, engineers, and artillery cannot enter an area containing enemy units unless they have friendly combat units with them. Maybe that's why you need to stack, as you actually have to start with combat units and move the whole distance with them. Because remember, you can't pick things up. Um, and it has to be accompanied by the friendly combat units, not, um, not entering an area that contains uh, friendly units. Um, if you walk into an area with a commander alone, it's eliminated. 
No unit can normally enter a fortress occupied by enemy units unless there's already a breach in the wall. The units in the fortress can exit it, uh, even if they enter an area occupied by enemy units, i.e. some sort of sally. No unit can ever cross an impassable boundary. Those have X's on the map. Um, I did not point out any of these. Here's a big X. Here's a big X. Yeah, they're pretty clear. They look like they're in the middle of areas just because of the coloring and the way they, you, my eye focuses on them. But yeah, they're right on boundaries to indicate that's an impassable boundary. Hmm. Uh, and you can't enter the Adriatic Sea. Just here. <laughs> Uh, all units exiting the map are eliminated. Okay. There's three types of combat. Field combat. Each time one or more activated units enters an area occupied by enemy combat units. Artillery bombardment, which is either against enemy fortresses or against besieging units or through a breach. Uh, and then mining and countermining of the fortress walls. For field combat, your combat units, and those of the defending player, fire against each other. All commanders and attacking units fire, as well as all commanders and defending combat units. Um, engineers do not fire in field combat, but they can get killed. To resolve a field combat, you roll a die for each unit and compare it to the fire value of the unit. If you roll less than or equal to the fire value of the unit, it has caused a hit on the enemy. This is simultaneously rolled, and the person taking the hits decides how to allocate them. Um, commanders cannot absorb enemy hits. However, after the die rolls, if you've taken a hit, you have to make a survival check for the commander. If you roll a one or two, the commander has become a casualty. Once both players have taken their fire results, if either side has annihilated the other, it gets to remain. Otherwise, whoever took the most hits has to retreat. If it's equal, the attacker must retreat. When a combat unit takes a hit, it's not immediately removed usually. It's flipped over to its disorganized side. If it doesn't have a disorganized side, it dies on one hit. Commanders who become casualties get flipped over to their backside to be replaced by their replacement commander. Uh, if they don't have one, they'll be removed from the game and the replacement commander doesn't get flipped back over to the original. Um, a disorganized unit, uh, it doesn't actually say that, I'm just telling you. A disorganized unit has reduced combat capability. We can take a quick look at one. That one doesn't have one. Let's look for a real unit. Here's a real unit. It's got a two instead of a three. And I stopped for no good reason to do that. Uh, if a disorganized unit gets hit a second time, it's removed from the game. Eliminated units are set aside up here. Um, combat units, this is to keep them from getting mixed in with reinforcements, which are above there. I don't know why you can't just put them off the map. Um, uh, eliminated units are set aside, yeah. Combat units can recover from disorganization and return to their front side um, during an activation. They'd have to take the reorganized uh, action. Uh, in a field combat, the side that there's just one round of combat uh, that's absorbed most hits, um, actual hits, you don't count the missed hits from forts or fortified towns. Um, I'll have to retreat. If they're equal, the attacker has to retreat. Commanders are not considered hits. Uh, retreat cannot take place into areas containing enemy units or through impassable boundaries. Attacking units must retreat into the area from which they entered. If the unit has to retreat and cannot, it's removed from the game. A force that attacked within a fortress through a breach may decide to take an additional hit instead of retreating out of the fortress. Uh, in this case, uh, a force that is attacked inside a fortress. In this case, the attacker has to retreat. So, um, yeah, assaulting the fortress is not going to be trivial. It won't just surrender for being beaten up. Bombardment. 
We got three special counters for this, the mine, uh, the fortress, wall level counters, and then these breach markers. Artillery can be used as any other combat unit in a field combat. Furthermore, they can bombard a fortress or enemy units, but they cannot participate in field combat through a breach because you'd have trouble rolling them in. Uh, if there's one or more engineer units in the area from which the artillery unit fires, the firing artillery unit uses the fire value on the counter. Otherwise, it has a fire value of only one. Um, this has to do with being able to dig the, uh, the parallels moving up to the wall so that you can get good shots at it without getting hurt. Um, let's see what we got here. Oh, when you fire an artillery unit, uh, if you roll a six, it's just blown itself up. Uh -huh. And our activated artillery, and that's when you're using it, uh, I assume, um, yeah, for bombardment, not for just shooting enemy units. An activated artillery unit can bombard an adjacent fortress area. Um, let me just see. If there are one or more engineers, the fire and artillery unit has a fire. See, it says, you say, I'm not sure here, because artillery units can be used as any other combat unit in a field combat. Furthermore, they can bombard fortresses. This is under bombardment. Um, I think, actually, all the firewalls, including the engineers, um, apply to all artillery fire. So artillery are only one point firing. Uh, units if you don't have an engineer even in field battle which is kind of disturbs me but an activated artillery unit can bombard an adjacent fortress area if the die roll is successful the fortress level of fortification is decreased by one when a fortress level is zero you get a breach marker and from this moment on the player can enter the enemy fortress area by that boundary to perform a field combat against the units within it. The current level of fortification of each side of the fortress is marked with a numbered counter as needed. Uh, you can activate it, artillery units occupying a fortress can fire on enemy units in adjacent areas. Artillery units can also fire through a breach against enemy units in an adjacent area. And in this case, their fire value is reduced by one. All the units in the area receiving fire um, cannot fire in turn, but they do have to retreat if an enemy, if any unit absorbs a, uh, a center, even if they can do it if they want. Mm, that feels wrong. It feels like there's something not correctly written there. Uh, all the units in the area receiving fire cannot fire in turn, but they do not have to retreat if any unit absorbs, I guess, casualty. But I guess they can retreat if they desire. I think that's what's this is a very badly translated sentence. <coughs> um, or else I'm not understanding it at all, in which case it's probably still very badly translated. But uh, the side that suffered at least one hit has to make a check on survival for its commanders on the combat area. So remember, if you're bombarding, basically, whether it's the fortress wall or enemy units, they don't get to fire back directly. Um, and they don't have to retreat if they don't want to. Now, the question is the fire through a breach. Activated artillery units occupying a fortress can fire on enemy units in adjacent areas. Artillery units can also fire through a breach. So that definitely records the idea or covers the idea of the attacker can fire through the wall that's breached at the defending units. What's the question is whether or not fire value is reduced by one for defending units firing through a breach because they no longer have the wall um, to station their artillery on or something like that. I'm not sure how to, how to interpret that. Again, 
Uh, yeah. Okay, mining fortresses. The engineers activate in an area adjacent to a fortress can try to mine the boundary, the wall of a fortress. You roll a die for each engineer. If this is less than or equal to their fire value, a mine is placed. Mark the side of the mine fortress with a mine counter. You can place more than one mine on the same side of a fortress. Um, in subsequent activation of units in the area, the engineer can then try to explode the mine. You cannot have a mine explode in the same turn that you placed it. Roll a die for each pair of engineers and mines. If the roll is one, two, or three, the mine explodes and a breach is immediately created. If the die roll is six, the mine is lost and it's removed from the map. Uh, four or five, no effect. If at any time the area adjacent uh, to the fortress, and again here, you see a typo. Um, that wouldn't bother me, but there's a failure on that other sentence. I kind of feel like maybe there wasn't as much uh, vetting uh, and, and proofreading as might be, but this, you know, could happen anywhere. If at any time the area adjacent to the fortress boundary with mines is vacated by combat units, the mines are removed. Um, that's the attacker's combat units. Countermining. Uh, Engineers within the fortress may attempt to countermine the boundary. If it contains mines, you roll a die for each unit, and if it's less than or equal to the fire value of the engineer, a mine is removed from the map. Uh, fortress reconstruction. The engineers inside a fortress may attempt to rebuild an adjacent boundary featuring a fortress level marker, not a breach. Roll a die for each of the engineer. If it's less than or equal to the engineer's value, uh, fortress level a fortress level is restored up to the maximum. Special units, commanders and engineers. Uh, they cannot enter an area containing enemy units and are eliminated by enemy units or in the area. Uh, they occupy unless uh, accompanied by other friendly units. The commanders help in fighting. We already talked about that. And handling large core, which... Eh, how did they help in fighting? How do they help in fighting? Oh, they get to roll a die in combat. Um, yeah. And the way they handle the large core is the multi-area, being able to select multiple areas to move from. Um, the engineers have special abilities, mining, countermining, fortress reconstruction, and fort rebuilding, or fort building. We haven't gotten to fort building yet. That'll be here. Uh, there are some on the map already. Infantry. Some infantry have two values. Uh, the left value is used when they attack, the right one when they're defending. Uh, Cernide units, they say C-A-R on them. Uh, they're conscripts, they're eliminated if they take a single hit. There's no limit to the number of units you can stack during a game turn. However, at the end of the turn, if there are more than six infantry or cav units, other units don't count, the number of infantry or cav units beyond six equal to the number of units in, uh, is, okay. You remove a number of infantry and cav beyond six equal to the number of units, no, you don't remove. You disorganize um, a number of infantry or cav units uh, that is beyond six in the area out of the good ordered units. Um, but it's just a disorganization. So they don't just disappear. And what that means is you could have like a rolling, you know, if you had like I don't know, 15 units in a space, well, that, that wouldn't help. Let's say you have 12 units in the space. Six of them would become disorganized, but if those 12 units are still there, six organized, six disorganized, the other six will become disorganized. So, yeah. All right. Um, when an engineer is activated, it can spend all its movement allowance to build a fort in an area without enemy combat units. The fort's effect will decrease by one the hits by enemy units attacking the area with any applicable form of combat. Only one fort marker can be present in a given zone at the same time. That changes in the advanced rules. It's possible to build a, a fort in an area with a fortified town, and their effects add up. You cannot build forts inside fortresses, though. The number of fort markers is a uh, deliberate limitation. Uh, a fort is destroyed and the marker removed from the game if combat units enter a zone with the fort alone or win a field combat in the area. The removed forts cannot be recovered. They are gone. 
So this is a limitation on how many forts you can build in the length of the game. Um, there's fortified towns on the board. These uh, give the same benefits as forts. A fortified town is destroyed and its effect vanishes for the rest of the game if enemy units win a field battle in the area. You use a breach marker to mark that the town is destroyed. If I don't have enough of those, I can throw other counters in. If there's a fort in a fortified town area, the unit defending it is defeated in a field combat. Only the fort is destroyed. And they're additive, so I'd be able to subtract two hits from a combat against me. The cards are used to generate random events. Ah, this thing has a nasty gloss on it, um, which you can see. I'm trying to make it go away, but can't really do it. Uh, and assist players in warfare operations. Follow the instructions written on the card, paying attention to the conditions. Uh, the card lists instructions that apply only to one or both of the players. If not specific, the card applies to the player of the card. Some cards say mandatory on them. These cards cannot be held or discarded and subject to the limits described in these rules must be played at the first opportunity, even if this has adverse effects on you. If a player has a mandatory card in his hand, he cannot draw a card. He must do an action which will allow him to play that card. This action must be the first thing the player does during his command activation. Some mandatory cards have only after a date. They're only mandatory after the given date. At or before that date, they cannot be played, but they can be discarded. If you have more than one mandatory card in hand, you're only required to play one of them, and you decide which one to play. Uh, some say, it doesn't say you may only play one of them. Some cards have the words remove if used. These are permanently removed from the game. Some have the words 1617. Here they are. Uh, uh, after the first game turn of 1617, uh, those cards are shuffled and put face down on top of the deck without affecting the discard pile. So they are just a triggered set of effects that are sitting on the top of the deck at that point. Respecting the above directives, cards can be played before or after the activation of units unless special directives are written on the cards themselves. When a card causes a unit to enter the map that belongs to a command that is not already on the map, you get the command marker, and I've got them on top of the commands that don't have them, uh, into the cup. Uh, no, it goes on the map and it'll go back into the cup on the next turn. When a card implies entering units in an area when enemy units are present, there will be a field combat. If the attacking units are defeated and must retreat, they're eliminated. Units caused to enter the map by a card are usually taken from the reinforcements, uh, unless stated differently, so maybe some come out of the eliminated. The word unit on the card must always be interpreted as combat unit. Uh, the game turn marker, when it goes past the end of game marker during the game turn, uh, the game turn ends and the victory points are counted. Victory points are accumulated by the players during the game turn play of some cards and through the booty markers. Those are the botinos. Victory points are marked with the appropriate markers on the table on the map. At the beginning of the game, player receives some booty markers that are placed face down. Uh, if you enter an enemy's booty marker, you flip it over. If it's got a question mark, you roll a die and get that many victory points. If there's a number, you get that many. And these are the locations that have victory points. Uh, Palma and Udin. Where is Udin? Up here. Okay. And then Doot, Doot, Doot. Three ten pointers. Both sides have 30 points of victory points, basically. Uh, Palma is worth 20. All right. Advanced rolls. Because... We just have to. Basically, the game feels pretty simple, so let's keep going. Um, in the advanced game, you do not have to always stop when entering enemy spaces. Rivers. And, and we'll hit the special cases. Those are for raids and light cavalry incursions. Uh, okay. There are river boundaries, which are treated differently. Rivers without a bridge are impassable for artillery and the camp. Uh, they're also impassable during retreat. 
for purposes of tracing supply and command span. Uh, they can be crossed during movement, except for the artillery in the camp, but a unit that uses all of its movement allowance to do this, a line of supply and command span can only be traced through a bridge, uh, and retreats can only happen across bridges. When a command span, when a command marker is extracted, you can play uh, up to a card, one card, and activate the units of the selected core on a number of areas equal to the leadership value of the core commander. This is the base role. In the advanced game, to be activated in this way, you must be within the core commander's command span, equal to two areas from the area in which the commander is located, and this cannot cross impassable boundaries nor enemy units, nor rivers, unbridged rivers, but okay. Commanders in field combat. When a commander occupied by friendly units enters an area containing enemy units, the field combat does not immediately occur. Instead, the commander can activate friendly units Both commanders and combat units not already activated in numbers equal to his leadership value in areas within his command span. The path of areas from the commander to these units must not cross impassable boundaries nor areas containing enemy units. Units so activated may belong to different core than the commander's one. Units activated in this way can no longer be activated in future activations. You will need to use the activation markers for these to remind you um, that these units have now been activated outside their normal command span. The commander is activated in this manner cannot activate other units. All activated units, if they move, must have movement capacity able to reach the combat area. If both players have a number of combat units in the battle equal to or greater than six, the battle can be fought in multiple rounds. Otherwise, it's just normal. Players need to keep track of how many hits each player inflicts on the opponent. Fight a combat round and apply the results, applying the terrain effects. If the number of hits actually suffered is equal for the two players, go to another round, only if both players won it. Otherwise, the combat is over. If a player wins the round and inflicts more losses than his opponent, he can choose whether to continue with another combat round or finish the battle. Now, I'm a little disturbed by this, if the number of hits is actually, I, I think a player can retreat, is what we're going to be getting to here. The combat is over. If the total number of suffered hits is equal for both sides, the attacker has to withdraw. Otherwise, the side who suffered the more hits has lost the battle and must retreat. No. It looks like the defender can say, yeah, I don't want to fight another round, and the attacker has to leave. Uh, if they're equal. Okay, difficult terrain. Difficult terrain... Uh, all attacking units with a fire value of three or more are reduced by one. Forts. In the advanced game, up to three forts can be built in the same area, and their effects are cumulative. A command may build only one fort per zone in a given activation. If combat units enter an area with enemy forts only, or win a field combat in the area, they have the option of destroying all the enemy forts or converting part of or all enemy forts into friendly, destroying any forts which are not converted. Turn the converted forts on the side with the color of the player occupying the area. As an additional action, when an engineer is activated, it can spend all of its movement allowance to destroy a friendly fort uh, where it's activated. Combat units may recover from disorganization and are turned to their good order side in their next activation if only if they are supplied. Out of supplied units cannot recover from disorganization. I have to swap batteries. Speaking of supply, a unit's in supply if it's in an area where it's possible uh, to trace an uninterrupted sequence of areas from the unit to its own supply source. Tracing the sequence of areas, one cannot cross impassable boundaries, rivers without bridges, or areas with enemy units. Each player has their own supply source, boom, and way over there in Austria. Um, marked with a special symbol on the map and are differentiated by color, the presence or absence of a line of supply is checked only at the start of an activation of units in an area. The Venetian player can supply by sea one area bordering the Adriatic Sea per game turn. And there's a little marker, which... Let me put here... Um, 
Units in that area are in supply and have a tax supply for the game turn. Units in the area with its own supply source are always supplied. If Gradiska is captured by the Austrian units, it is considered supply, is occupied by the Austrians. It's considered supplied even if it doesn't have a valid line of supply. Uh, as long as the Austrians occupy Rubia. So this is Gradiska, Rubia is right across, but not adjacent. <coughs> okay. Um, a unit with no valid supply line gets one of these Fiori <laughs> markers um, out of supply. The markers were moved if the unit's in supply on its next activation. Out of supply commanders have their leadership value reduced to one, which means they can only command one area. Uh, out of supply combat units have their movement allowance reduced by one and cannot recover from disorganization. Some game you, uh, Excuse me. Some game events may require units to be supplied if a supply card is played and the camp has been eliminated or there's no valid line of supply for the camp, the supplies are lost and the army morale drops. Otherwise, it rises as indicated on the card. I'm sorry, my throat is killing me. I have to break. Okay, uh, a unit without a valid supply line is out of supply. It's marked with the marker. We talked about this. Okay, attack supply. Uh, units intending to do certain operations must have attack supply in the area in which they're activated. Field combat, raid, uh, with three or more combat units. I think that may be both. Field combat or raid, comma, with three or more combat units, comma, fortress bombardment, mining the fortresses and building forts. Units recalled by a commander um, this is the adding additional units into a, a battle, are not required to have attack supply. If a unit has attack supply, if it's in an area from where a line of supply, no longer than three areas, with difficult terrain counting as two, can be traced from the unit to the camp, uh, excluding the area the unit is in, but including the area with the camp, and then from the camp through a line of any length back to its supply source. Exception, units in Trieste and either side's units in any fortress are exempted from the above rules and can always do any operation regardless of attack supply. Army morale, up there. Each army in the game has a morale value that can change during the game from events and play of cards. The initial morale value of each army is given in the scenario instructions. It's seven. And the current morale value, they're, they're really... Uh, it's weird there's only one scenario, so, um, to say that, but. And the current morale value is marked on the map with a special marker. The army morale can go up with raids, and it goes down with the passage of time and the play of some cards. Some cards can send it up or down. <laughs> okay. Uh, when it's written on the timeline, morale minus one, Uh, the morale of each army drops by one. When morale is green, there's no effects. And it starts close to green, it appears. Uh, right at the bottom of green. When it gets to yellow, each command can only activate units in a single area. You no longer get your commander bonus. When it gets down to red, no, the unit cannot receive attack supply. And each command can activate units in a single area. You can never enter an area with enemy units, and you cannot play more than one card per activation. You can never go beyond the one or nine. Raids. One or more activated infantry or cavalry units can declare a raid at the moment they enter a non-fortress area. The area can also contain enemy units, and in this case, they're not compelled to stop in the area if at the end of the raid they have enough movement points to exit. Every raid attempt subtracts one from the movement allowance of each unit. You roll a die to raid. If you roll a one, you've succeeded. If you roll a six, the raid fails, and the units that tried it are disorganized and can no longer move for the rest of the turn. And I guess that means they get trapped in the area. Otherwise, the die roll is less than or equal to the number of units that attempted the raid. It's been successful. In this case, Um, 
In this case, modify the die roll result by plus one for each enemy unit or fort present in the area. If the raid has been successful, remove any out of supply markers on the raiders, raise the army morale for the raiders by one, and place a raid marker in the area. The area cannot be raided for the remainder of the current year. Remove all raid markers at the end of the last round of the current year. If a raid succeeds in an area with the enemy camp, the raider's army morale goes up by two instead of one. Yeah. Uh, within the limits written above, the number of raid attempts can be tried in the same or different areas for each command activation, which I think means the countermix is not a limit. Regardless of the raid's outcome, if both players have units in the area at the end of a raid, a field combat will result. <coughs> the Venetian player's area of possible raids include the areas on the map with a green background to the east of Gradisco, that side. Uh, Tarvis, the adjacent areas of the river... Lisonzo and Vinatison. Tarvis. Hmm. I see the Vinatison there. I'm trying to understand. Not sure I understand the way this is worded. It's they include the areas with the green background to the east of Gradiska, the hole, <coughs> Carso and Istria. Uh, no, this is this is going to be parenthesized. Okay, the area to the east. So that's this greenish thing here. Um, Harvest the adjacent areas of the river Lisonzo and Vinetio Son. So that's going to be this and this. Okay, I wonder why the coloring was done that way. The Austrian player can raid all eligible areas with a name on the map. West of Gradisca, in addition, Sagrado, Monfalcon, and Muggia. I don't know where Muggia is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, Dalmatia is still um, owned by Venice. Okay. The camp. There's a marker on the board for the camp. This is, uh, allows attack supply. The camp can move one area per turn without any units. Uh, when any units of any command is activated in the area where the camp is located, it does not affect the stacking of units or combat. The camp can never enter a fortress. You turn it upside down after it's moved. If the camp is the last unit that remains in an area after a field combat, or is the only, area in, uh, only unit in an area where an enemy force enters, it's eliminated. Army morale goes down by one. The first, at the first in any subsequent game turn during which the camp is not in play, it reappears in a subsequent turn in any area uh, with its own supply source, provided there are friendly units in the area during the activation of units in the command. Well, there's only one area with its own supply source. Uh, okay. Um, I think it had a movement allowance of two, if I recall correctly. Special units, cavalry. All cavalry units in January or February um, have a reduced movement allowance of only three areas. Like cavalry, they have an L on them. Um, are not required to stop if they enter alone into an area occupied by enemy units. 
After entering such an area and attacking it, they're allowed to retreat from the area from which they entered. If they have sufficient remaining movement allowance. In this type of combat, the defender cannot fire. Okay, so you can do a harassment type raid, which is against enemy units. A light cavalry unit can execute this type of combat a number of times per activation, provided it has enough movement allowance, but not more than one time against a single area. <coughs> so I could... It, it's got this retreat from the area, I think, to, it, to the area which they entered or something like that. I, it's, it, there's not an easy way to express it, but I think that's what they mean, is that you retreat back to the area that you came from, and then you'd be able to move again. And they have like five movement points, so you could raid a couple areas. Um, a light cavalry unit performing a raid is automatically disorganized. The cards. Mandatory cards with only after date X are mandatory only after the indicated de date. In the advanced game, before or at the specified date, cards of this type bringing in reinforcements cannot be discarded. And if any of these cards are played, the reinforcements listed on the card must be placed on the timeline in the game turn box corresponding to the date on the card. <coughs> at the beginning of each turn, after the positioning game turn, you roll a die for each of the reinforcement groups on the timeline. If the result is less than or equal to the distance in game turns, um, the reinforcement group is placed where the card indicates, so it can come in a little early. And then we have some stuff in Italian. Um, obviously, there's some rough edges in the rulebook. Uh, some places where it's kind of hard, and it may just be the translation more than anything else. We may find the same with <coughs> some of these cards. Um, I'm a little confused because over here, one of the initial four cards the Venetian player has is card number one, which can only be played after the first activation of the Austrian Triest command. <coughs> Yellow. Um, there's some indication that there's cards that you start the game with. I don't remember seeing that in the rolls. I certainly didn't read it tonight. Uh, I don't know. I have to look that up before I actually start. But again, my throat's shot, and uh, we're going to send this up and then take a look at it. Overall, it's a fairly simple game for the basic game. The advanced game adds some interesting ideas to it that... I think are going to add some flavor, and obviously a lot can be baked into the cards. This is the big advantage of the CDG, is not in other event-driven games too. Not a lot of you you can get around a lot of having really really complex rules by baking them into the cards more. All right, let's send this up.